My name is Dr. Tom Crummel. Uh, I'm a uh, surgeon at Stanford. Uh, I have two roles. One as a surgeon in chief at the Children's Hospital, so I do pediatric surgery by trade. And then secondly, as chair of the Department of Surgery, so the adult-based Department of Surgery. And then finally, in my spare time, we uh, co-direct the Biodesign Innovation Program with Paul Yock at Stanford, which tries is a fellowship to train a next generation of surgeon, physician, innovators, and entrepreneurs. It takes a long time to learn how to be a surgeon. Four years of college, four years of medical school, and five to nine years of additional training. So the average surgeon is 33 to 36 before they have a real job. The process uh, is is one of graduated responsibility, uh, moving up in responsibility and ability so that by the time they finish, they are independent, safe, and then able to learn on their own as they evolve their practice. It's a time-honored tradition, uh, and that's both the good news and the bad news. Uh, We know that every year we can bring in an intern class, and five to seven years later, we're pretty confident that they will be safe, independent, thoughtful clinician surgeons that can work on their own. We do that mainly in the hospital. So the tradition has been one that is very apprentice model. Come spend five to seven years with us and you'll walk out the door being a surgeon. That is giving way, I think, to uh, increasing awareness that a lot of sitting around and waiting and service doesn't fully serve the educational needs. So increasing awareness that they're instead of waiting for a problem in the hospital, We can build a curriculum in a simulated set of exercises and drills and devices so that maybe we can streamline the process, maybe we can be sure that we're consistent, and maybe we could even think about compressing it some so that we could get people through, especially trying to understand what are the competencies that are needed and beginning to get at outcomes-based education rather than time-based education. You know, if you look at current surgical tools and technology, laparoscopic surgery is probably a good example. Used to make, you know, for your gallbladder, you make an incision from here to here. Now we use tiny tools the size of this pen, and we get the same operation done. That's interesting from two points of view. One is, how did those tools develop? Two, how did we train an installed generation of surgeons who learned this to do this? It makes you think. And it, uh, it, it makes you take a look at, so what do we have that's currently available? Is it easy to modify? Do we need a whole new set of tools? Is it a tool that you ask someone else to build? Is it something that you build? Is it the basis of a startup? Uh, you know, is it a platform technology that goes far enough to, to be a standalone or, or not? And, um, and again, part of what we try to teach in the innovation program is the process from the idea, the invention, to the embodiment, the innovation, to the entrepreneurial skills to put it into something that gets it done and brings it to the bedside. And hopefully we can train a next generation to do that. Huge impediment to innovation in children. There are actually three. One is small markets. Uh, So automatically you go from... uh, $100 $100 million business to a $20 million business. Two, um, the payer mix. So while much of the adult population is insured in this country, a substantial portion of children are insured by the Medicaid programs, which by and large do not pay nearly as well. Thirdly, if you ever wanted to get the FDA to approve something in children, uh, the, the, the cost of doing that trial is prohibitive. So FDA bar, payer mix, and market size, other than that, children are a great place to innovate. So we, w- those of us that work in that space are highly mission-driven. We understand that we need the margin side, and that's where we look for duality. You'd never start a rare disease in children device manufacturing company is a standalone with an expect with an expectation to be a for profit you might want to rethink is this a philanthropic effort uh, which is sometimes driven the orphan drug world uh, could this be an enlightened philanthropic where maybe you made a little bit of money but that's acceptable uh, could it 
could it be that if you really rethought the adult piece, the market gets bigger? And, and we've taken all of those approaches as we thought about different devices and different clinical problems. Thinking about clinical problems, walking around the hospital, crawling into the weirdest corners looking for unmet needs, talking to physicians, listening not only to what they say, but what they don't say and what they do. And if they see someone in the operating room that looks like they're playing Twister, the surgeon may say, oh, this is how we do it. They say, do you really want to play Twister? I mean, does that make any sense? Couldn't we do this an easier way? They then take a whole bunch of observations, try to say, well, what's interesting? What's a market that we think would support it? Is there intellectual property? Do we have a novel insight? The output at the end of the year are a number of device ideas, business plan competitions, and the beginnings of nascent entrepreneurial-driven businesses that may ultimately come to fruition, may get licensed out, or like many, will wind up in a scrap heap. We also try to make sure that the scrap heap we catalog because the failure today doesn't mean that it's a bad idea if we only had some unique new energy source, material. If that comes along, we want to remember that we just needed that energy source and we're back, to, we're back in business. We tend to be device-driven. Uh, I'm not smart enough to be a biopharma guy. Uh, gadgets are easier for me to understand. So I think you look for the person that um, wa was tinkering and took apart a car or um, you know, built a porch or understands squares and angles and corners and circles. And um, uh, we think team backgrounds make sense because most successful businesses, not well-told story, happen to be aggregations of teams. You look at Hewlett and Packard. You look at Larry and Sergey, modern day in Google. Um, you know, uh, uh, Jobs and Wozniak. I mean, the story over and over again is frequently an inside and outside person, a engineer and manager and a leader and an outside, a lot of ways to skin it. So we think team behavior and experience is good. We look for those that gravitate towards and find us. You know, uh, the motivation is uh, critical. Uh, and, and I'm a good old fashioned work ethic kind of guy. I, uh, you know, I, I've never thought of myself very smart, but I always figured I could outwork most people. So we look for those traits in people track record of solving problems, working hard, staying up late, going the extra mile. And we don't need to find a hundred of them. We, we can find a couple every year. We are entrusted to not just provide the best possible care today, but to make the future better for our children. And that step inevitably involves a commercial step. Now we can choose to wall ourselves off. The problem is that we expect to be stewards of support for research, that research must be applied. And if you're not willing to make that jump, uh, I, I worry that we're missing a step in getting the innovation back to the bedside. It's not for everybody. Uh, it needs to be done with sort of the highest standards of responsibility, first and foremost, to the patient. Uh, full disclosure, and uh, I think uh, some people can do the balance, and uh, I happen to think that those that can uh, really are the ones that can make a huge difference. Uh, I'll use the example. So I personally can, uh, let's say I do 500 operations a year, and I do a, 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 give me a career of 40 years. So 500 operations a year for 40 years, 20,000 operations. If we can develop a device that is used in hundreds of thousands of children, my work output and its impact is enormously expanded, enormously leveraged. A good friend of mine, Rodney Perkins, talks about entrepreneurs and their ability to gather resources. And he uses a short video of a, um, it, it must be like an Australian sheepdog. And he says, you need to move all of the pieces, re, not necessarily the sheep, through the gate in a finite period of time. And whether it's people, knowledge, motivation, alignment, uh, and, and to combine them, deal with risks, deal with the rainstorm or the wolf that is interfering with that, yeah, it's an entrepreneur. And I think uh, in my talk today, I talk about how entrepreneurs want control and uh, freedom and mobility to maximize success and risk. That sounds to me like a surgeon.